so it wouldn't be fair to talk about Liverpool and the, the Mersey without talking about shipping. And uh, so that's my bit. Uh, I used to work at NOC uh, with Bill at the Permanent Service Mean Sea Level uh, and, uh, and left uh, a few years ago now to, to run my own business, which is really about taking some of the technology that we've uh, developed at NOC and taking that into uh, the commercial world of, of shipping. So um, and for my motivation for this, and this is my only sort of wordy slide, um, I just wanted to, to go back to a paper uh, in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. So this is, you know, the, 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 probably the, sort of the top journal from 1906, and, and James Shawbread uh, wrote, Liverpool, the premier port of the world after our metropolis, our metropolis being London, uh, with the annual total in and out tonnage in 1904 of 32 millions of tonnes, had suffered in the approach thereto for about 15 years, a sandbar situated at the outer or seaward entrance into Liverpool Bay, which afforded a depth of water over it at low water of equinoctial uh, springs of only 10 feet. Okay, this is relevant because it's all about Bill talking about uh, their, our big tides and, and the impact on the shipping. Uh, when it's borne in mind that some of the large Atlantic liners are only a draft of close upon 30 feet, so 10 meters, um, it's easy to conceive the amount of inconvenience, chiefly by loss of time and enforced waiting outside the bar, which this caused a period of waiting which affected more or less, according to their individual tunnel, tonnage, all vessels visiting uh, the port. So this problem of the big tides and relatively shallow water just outside at the bar, which we'll look at in a minute, has been a problem for quite a long time. In fact, he goes on to say that they started trying to have a look at this problem in 1838 and didn't sort of vigorously attack it until 1890. Also interestingly, um, in this, uh, in this, they had a little committee, which was the, the British Association for the Advancement of Science, of which Mr. Uh, Shortbread was the uh, secretary, but the chair of it was, was Lord Kelvin. Uh, also on it was George Darwin. Uh, and there was three other FRSs, uh, Osborne Reynolds uh, and a couple of other people. And you just cannot imagine, and it shows, shows you how important uh, uh, shipping and the port of Liverpool was at the time. You couldn't imagine the Royal Society uh, uh, and probably the, the foremost scientist of his day spending his time thinking about tides in the Mersey now, but anyway. Um, Phil also pointed out that you've seen this uh, before. So this is a postcard. Uh, uh, this is obviously an extremely significant event, the uh, Mauritania coming into the port of Liverpool. Um, according to my notes, uh, the, the, the Mauritania, which is the largest vessel of its kind in 1906, remains so until the RMS... Olympic in 1911, so I'm not quite sure where the Lusitania fits into all of this, um, but, um, but it had a draft of 10.1 metres, 33 feet, which uh, is, is, is relevant um, because the, the, uh, today's largest, you probably remember the three queens of um, uh, May 2015, so the Queen Mary 2 is the largest ocean-going liner ever built. Uh, and that also has a draft of 10 metres, so actually in line of terms, nothing has changed very drastically uh, in terms of draft, at least uh, in, in all of that time, and it's probably because a lot of ports are only accessible with, with, with that kind of draft. Other ships, however, have changed rather drastically. So, uh, um, so the biggest ship on the Mersey uh, to date is actually uh, the... Um, how do we use this? So the, the uh, ACL's Atlantic Star uh, uh, is a, called a Conroe vessel, so it's a, it's a uh, combination of containers and Roro, uh, Roro being roll on, roll off. Uh, uh, that has an 11 and a half piece draft, uh, 38 metres beam, that's the width of it, and 296 metres length. And this is a pretty big beast, if you've ever been up and, and seen it when it's in um, uh, in dock at, at uh, Seaforth, uh, you, you certainly know about it. It's only the big, largest ship to enter Gladstone Dock. And in fact, we, we, the Seaforth passage had to be widened about 20 metres to, to accommodate her, and that's quite uh, interesting because it's um, when you come into the dock system, there's, there's two there's two entrances into the northern dock, um, uh, Gladstone Dock here, uh, and 
and uh, Sandon, uh, sorry, Langton Dock, uh, which is a bit further down here somewhere. Um, and, and the route of it is to, is to, to, to come in, uh, turn, which is also relevant, uh, and then to, to enter through, through this, this dock gates, uh, very large dock gates at, at either end here. And then once it's into the, the dock system, uh, coming through uh, Seaforth Passage, uh, which was 40 metres wide, and you imagine that the vessel was 38 metres wide, that's quite tight. Uh, but actually, I think more relevant, it, it, was, it was in order so that it could, it could swing round, and this is the Seaforth Container Terminal. This area here, oops, here, is the area that's been filled in now as uh, Liverpool 2. Okay, so when we, when we come to talk to that, you know, it's sort of filled in this, this triangle here, and we've got this new, new key side here. Um, the very strong tides are, are, are very, are, are tidal streams are very relevant uh, in terms of you trying to turn a, a vessel that's 300 <coughs> metres or so round and then get it through this very narrow gap, and that's quite a big problem. Um, so, does anybody know which is the largest ship ever built? Somebody is bound to know. Right. Also known as, it's actually had lots of different names, yeah. and, uh, which is also known as the Knock Nevis. I knew some of you, so it looked Clarkson a few years ago. So, this beast, amazingly, is, um, has, has a, a, a draft of some 80, 81 feet, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's just gigantic 24.6 meters. It's an oil tanker. Um, it's so big it actually couldn't transit the English Channel. So the English Channel with its shallowest point is 28 and a half metres. And you need a certain amount of under, uh, under kilo allowance. Uh, so for a 20 metre, two metre battle, it's about 6.4 metres. So once you, so that means you'd have to have the, you know, a, a decent tide and presumably they, they wouldn't, uh, uh, at least a metre and a half just to get that through. But I think they, they probably thought that was a bit too much. Um, so that's that's a, that's a heck of a beast. And just to give you an idea of scale, because you know you just can't really imagine, apart from the fact he's got six tugs around it. So this is a courtesy of Wikipedia, uh, a little comparison. So this is this is said Knock Nevis. Um, this is um, uh, the Queen Mary II, which is uh, you know, a, a fairly substantial vessel. The Pentagon, <laughs> right? <laughs> And Apple Park. I mean, I, I, I find it mildly amusing, really, that Apple built a building that's bigger than the Pentagon. But, you know, <laughs> um, uh, and the Empire State Building, obviously, lying on its side. But it, it, so this is this is an incredibly large vessel, um, and, and we're you know, the Queen Mary II is still, still very large in itself. Um, okay, so so the, all of this is coming together. So so we've got these sort of rather shallow. Uh, areas and clearly we're never going to get anything. Well, actually, this doesn't exist. This was scrapped. Uh, it was damaged in the Iran Iraq War and then uh, reinvented and then finally scrapped. I mean, it's like it's it, it's it's too big. It's just not. Um, but while those vessels have been getting, uh, 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 well, in some ways, not not any larger. Um, the the problem remains that we can't get anything like that into the dock systems. So uh, Liverpool 2, uh, which is uh, and this this ship, we'll, we'll come back to again in a minute, the the Amini. Um, somebody else, I think, showed you this. So this is the new Keyside wall. It's got uh, five cranes, I think, uh, down there. Is that right? Maybe six. I don't know. Um, uh, rail system to to get the. the um, it hasn't been as as busy uh, as it as it might have been expected to be, and the, the story behind this is quite interesting. So this came into um, function uh, uh, a year or two ago now, um, and the the when it was conceived in about two thousand and five, um, the expansion of the Panama Canal was going to come underway, uh, and so I think we should probably talk about it because all of the discussion was this was allow a new route through from Southeast Asia. So the main, the main container shipping route uh, comes through from sort of um, Shanghai. Um, you can either go uh, uh, westwards and come round um, through sort of Singapore and um, then through Suez, or the shorter route is to go 
um, eastwards and going through Panama. Um, the problem with the Panama Canal, uh, as it was built previously, was it could only take vessels up to about six and a half metres drop. So what they did is they decided to build some new locks, a third set of locks, um, through uh, here and then uh, it's down, down here, which is make uh, what they consider to be uh, much larger vessels, uh, well, much larger vessels than, than previously available to come through. Um, and so Liverpool was well, great. We'll have all of these, this, this transatlantic shipping, we can, um, and, and indeed the uh, Pacific shipping, and we'll, we'll bring it all to Liverpool. It makes a lot of sense in terms of uh, waste of time. And at the time, uh, oh, actually, that's just uh, so the um, so this is just a the, the old locks. Um, you could get a, a draft of about twelve meters. Uh, through um, the the new ones uh, coming at about 15.2 meters, so they were talking about a, a, a vessel size. So a TEU um, is a uh, uh, um, equivalent units. Of, so the, the, the standard containers that you see on the back of a truck or, or whatever that's a that's a TEU. So we can take 4,410 4, uh, foot equivalent units. Those are you also get 20 <coughs> foot equivalent units. Sorry. Those are 20 foot equivalent units, they're also 40 foot equivalent units, uh, but 20 foot equivalent <coughs> units is the, is the standard for these. Um, 4,400 going up to 12,000, and that in 2005 was, was a remarkable <coughs> leap in vessel size. Um, you see that about, that's a bad choice by means of, okay, so, so let me just run through. So this is, this is the old pre-lock pre increase. So you could get 295 meter length through uh, with a width of 32 meters and a draft of 12 meters, and that would have about 5,000 containers on it. Okay, um, and you can see that even that's that's pretty big to, to get into the existing dock system. So the, the G5 that we talked about um, from ACL is 11 and a half meter draft, so it's still still too tight. Um, post Panamax, uh, so a longer <coughs> vessel, 366 metres, uh, 49, so wider, 49 metres, and, and a draft of 15.2, and that could take about 13,000 containers. Um, okay. Oh, the, sorry, the other thing I've got to say about Liverpool 2 is, is the, the way that they're, they're dealing with this, with the, we don't have a, a dock system, but the what they've done is they've got a, a, a 16 and a half metre berth pocket. So next to the key side, that's been dredged out to 16 and a half metres, which allows it to sit through the vessel to sit through the tide. Okay, so that, that's the reason that can work. And this isn't a particularly new idea, in as much as uh, a tram there across the river, which you may also see where the oil tankers come in. Um, they already have berth pockets there, so it was kind of thinking, well, okay, we, why, why don't we do this on a larger scale and bring it over, and we, maybe we can get these large contained vessels in. Um, there's, there's also given 854 metres of, of key size uh, with, with the Liverpool two department. So, fantastic. Finally, the, the 11 years after uh, being announced, the, the, the Panama Canal uh, got inaugurated in, in 2016. Um, so, it's a one of the marvels of the world, really, in terms of its engineering feat. Um, and the, the, the first ship to, to transit through there was the, the Con Costco shipping Panama. Um, beautiful. Um, the only problem is that the world have moved on. So uh, in 2005, the largest ship in the, in the world um, was the uh, Amersk vessel, uh, 12,000 TEU, this one here. What happened then, and uh, you know, there have been a, you know, a fairly gradual in increase in, in size over the last, you know, uh, previous, whatever that is, uh, 40 years or something. What happened <coughs> since then is this explosion in vessel size. Uh, so uh, the, the MMS was the first uh, uh, of these, but it was still uh, relatively small. Today, um, the largest vessel uh, as of 2019 is, is the uh, OOCL Hong Kong, um, which takes a staggering 21,413 containers. Um, 
And it, more to the point, it, it also has a draft of 16 metres or 52 feet. Right? So that's, we, we, our birth pocket was 16 and a half metres, so you might have half a metre <coughs> underneath, but there's no way that, that any vessel is going to come in uh, with that. But actually, th there are actually bigger limits to that, which we'll discuss very shortly. But you, you can see that there's this just gigantic uh, increase in, in, in containment, a little bit similar to the explosion in tanker sizes that led to the knock nevis. Now, the, uh, the, the Emma Maersk, uh, even back here, had a, uh, had a draft of 16.6 metres. Uh, so, actually, all of these vessels are pretty much the same at, 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 at 16 metre kind of, uh, of draft, but that's just, just too big, both for the Panama Canal and for, for Liverpool too. Uh, the Alini, uh, which we saw uh, alongside on Liverpool too for the photo opportunity, has a 13.5 metre draft but takes only 5,000 containers, okay? So, so the, 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 the scale of that is just completely different. The Queen Mary II, as I said earlier, only has a, uh, a, a draft of 10 meters, and giving them the three queens in the Mersey was an incredible um, bit of, of, of logistics just to make sure that, that everybody got in and out, as you probably appreciate. Um, and so, yeah, so, so Panama expansion now it's here, and then we suddenly have this sort of and this sort of uh, uh, real war going on of, of, of container uh, shipping size. And whether that continues or not, we don't know. But th there is a bit of a limit to growth in some ways. That the, the, and the the, the the sense is that thirty thousand is probably it isn't the upper limit in terms of uh, scale. But for the for the major shipping routes, the the limit is. Um, Malacca Strait, which is between Sumatra and uh, Malaysia, just remembering quickly, um, and and that only has that that really you, you can't go through that unless you, you you've got a uh, with with a draft base of twenty meters. By the time you get to thirty thousand T, you're going to be hitting that that limit. Um, of course, in the meantime, also Suez uh, got expanded as well, and so can take even bigger vessels. I think it's also worth noting, I mean, I, I hadn't realised how expensive it is to go through. It costs, does anybody know how much it costs to go through the Panama Canal? Guess. A 10,000 TU container going one way through the Panama Canal is $820,000. So it's a heck of a lot of money. Um, but uh, yeah, and it's even more going through Suez, uh, which are even bigger ships. So, let just give you an idea. Okay. Right, so uh, back to Liverpool. So um, you've seen uh, a version of this earlier. This is from a, a geomorphology paper. Um, Queen's Channel, uh, Crosby. So, so the problem for in Liverpool is that is, is really coming into Crosby Channel. Is there's a, a sort of a gradient of, of scale here, which isn't very clear. But in Crosby Channel, we or Queen's East, we we hit uh, eight metres <coughs> of. of, of, uh, of well, now dredged to eight metres. Prior to dredging for Liverpool II, that was uh, 6.9 metres, or 6.8 metres. Um, and that's, the pro this is the, in many ways the, the issue of the bar. So the problem is that for any vessel coming in, uh, it then takes 90 minutes or so, uh, depending on conditions, maybe up to 100 minutes, to then um, come up to uh, Liverpool, and to, oh, sorry, well, to, to Liverpool II, it takes about 90 minutes for this sort of transit. And um, uh, it's expensive dredging. Um, so the capital to, to bring this down by 1.1 meters, so from 6.9 to um, uh, 8 meters depth, uh, cost 41 million uh, pounds to, to, to that amount of dredging. Going back to the, the dredging ships that Bill showed earlier, so it's a heck of a lot of money. Um, and unfortunately, uh, nature being what it is, about half of that backfilled within six months. Okay. So, so, that's, so that's one of the reasons you don't see very big ships in the day. Um, uh, so it's an, it's an ongoing battle, as Phil pointed out. So that takes about 90 minutes. So that means, though, that if you need your full depth of, of, of tide, you need that full depth of tide 90 minutes before high water. And the reason for that is that you actually need to dock just about at high water. You can dock 30 minutes, up to 30 minutes after, but the problem is, as Phil was, or various other people talked about, the speed of the, of, of the, of the tidal streams, okay? So at high water, the tide has stopped, 
And if you've got a 300 metre vessel and you're trying to turn it round, because even for Liverpool too, you still have to turn it round to go onto the key side. To manoeuvre that, you actually need that to happen at slack water, which is at high water. So that means in order to get over the bar, which is your eight metres or seven and a half metres now maybe, uh, of depth, you need your that depth below plus the tide. So if you want a, uh, a, a 15 metre vessel to come in, okay, so you need your, say, seven and a half metres of uh, below plus seven and a half metres of tide plus your underkill clearance, which is about 10%, so about a metre and a half. So you've got to have, where are we up to? Uh, nine metres of tide, 90 minutes before high water, and that's why you don't get those ships in, okay? Because that just, that just doesn't happen. So if I've just said all this, uh, 90 minutes of transit time from Queen's East, um, largest vessels need to berth at high water and you need about an extra 10% of underkill clearance. That's a problem. So we, we did a study back in, I think, 2013 for the court. Um, they didn't ask us to do it, we just did it for them anyway. Um, and uh, the, the, the problem, and going back to sort of Phil's point earlier about the number of vessels that could arrive on particular tides. So, Taking into account, well, we actually allowed bursting up to 30 minutes after, which the harbour master allowed, but I have to say none of the pilots would be very happy with. Um, the maximum draft of vessel that could arrive on 100% of tides is 13.2 metres. Go back to thinking about the, the Alini. Uh, so, so that's your 5,000 TU vessel. This is not your 15,000, 16,000 TU vessels of, of today. So for that 15 min, metre draft vessel for the, these post Panamax, that could arrive on just 34% of tides. Now that is a real problem. And the reason that's a real problem, so whilst something like the Knock Nevis is a chartered vessel and, and whilst it's expensive in terms of time, it can arrive. Um, uh, well, we'll come back to it in a minute, but, but, but the uh, uh, container vessels are like buses, so they have a timetable. So um, I have no idea how well this is going, so I'm gonna to have to talk through this. This is um, the evolution of, of of draft, of, so ship depth by container capacity. So down here we've got a thousand, two thousand, three thousand. These error bars sort of just show, uh, so the, and, the, and the dot is the average. So what this is saying is that you've got a thousand containers <coughs> and it's about uh, eight metres of draft. And you see that it sort of uh, moves up. There weren't very many um, uh, 18,000 capacity vessels at this time, but actually they've come in at about 16 metres, so about up here. The red line that I've put on here is that 13.2 metres of 100% uh, of the tide. So you can see that actually, for the average vessel, you're down here somewhere, which is about 5,000, 6,000 containers. Um, this is the Panama Canal uh, level, 15 metres. And so you can see that they can take, well, some at least of these larger uh, container vessels, but actually they can't take the largest vessels either through them. So this has this been this sort of war, really, between this expansion of ship size and the, the infrastructure capability of it. This is not even discussing the problems of trying to unload 18,000 containers onto a road network or rail network, um, which I think if you live up by uh, Dunningsbridge Road, you'd probably feel upset about anyway. Um, but, it, but, it, but it's a massive problem. Okay, so, so just, to, just to explain why, why Liverpool 2 hasn't perhaps done what we what it, it set out to and what we hoped to do, there were some limits on it. Um, and just to make the point about buses, so this is the, the schedule for the Atlantic Star that we showed at the beginning, and it basically has a 32-day um, a, a uh, day cycle. Uh, so leaving Liverpool 27th of May, then goes Hamburg, Antwerp, back to Liverpool, then across the Atlantic to Halifax, New York, Baltimore, Portsmouth, and then back to Liverpool uh, on this case, June 28th. So it does this sort of cycle. So and bear in mind, it, it can't wait for the tide. It has to hit those dates, and it, it's losing time wherever it goes anyway. I mean, it's certainly not sitting outside waiting, thinking, okay, I need to wait for a spring tide to come in. Um, that's just not possible on, a, on, on this kind of schedule. So it's a, it's a big problem. And, um, but, yeah. Almost at the end. Uh, just to make the, the point then about a little bit about what I've been doing. Ship time's expensive, yes. Um, oil tankers can cost up to $100,000 a day. It depends on the state of the oil market, uh, largely. But uh, 
just to give you an idea, an extra 10 centimetres on a vessel coming into Tranmere is about half a million dollars of, of cargo. Uh, Southampton, which whilst we've said um, you know, has, has rather different ties to Liverpool, also has a very unusual tidal regime um, because it has a, a thing called the Young Flood Stand. So it only has, uh, or it has two high waters and one low water. But if you can get an extra, if you if you don't come in at the beginning of the Young Flood Stand, you lose about two hours, and that two hours is about 250 box with container moves. Um, so. If you wanted to make use of things like the weather and such, because we obviously we can predict the tide a long way in advance, but if we um, wanted to take uh, advantage of additional loading, so say we can predict these things now, uh, yeah, yeah, a few days in advance, if you're loading a, 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 an oil cargo in Antwerp and uh, want to deliver it to Liverpool in three days' time, um, if you've got an extra 20 centimetres of water, which turns out happens in about 20% of the tides, um, then you could go back to our sums earlier uh, about a, a million dollars of additional cargo. So it's probably worth having. So that's what we set out to do. So uh, the, the business that I set up was uh, called, uh, has a product called Vantage, which just brings all of this together really. So that everybody has a smartphone in their pocket, everybody can be connected and use these predictions. So we have this sort of messy world of um, uh, every pilot has a, a book of tide tables in their pocket and, and, and uh, you know, if it looks up the weather and that kind of thing. And we turn all of that into a, into a smartphone that um, looks like that. So we've, everybody has, has it in their pocket. So that's, that's the, uh, the, the future in terms of, of these. So thank you for listening. And um, I think probably questions from uh, Roger's face are probably afterwards rather than in. So thank you very much. <laughs>